Hey, what's going on, party people? It is BQ here along with Adam, and we're going to be talking about our thoughts about Impact Wrestling second quarter. So this is the second quarter review. The first one uh, was was pretty popular, so thought why not do it again and uh, keeping it in house this time with Adam. And uh, Adam, dude, it's kind of rare that you and I do anything together, just you and me. Yeah, it's it's like we've got a feud going on, isn't it? And uh, we just don't turn up at the same venue, and it's building to a pay per view uh, like this. Exactly, and uh, Slam Anniversary is here, so this is our Slam Anniversary main event. BQ and Adam uh, linking up to talk <laughs> this second quarter here. So um, we're gonna we're gonna get right into this. Uh, but of course, as always, whatever platform you're listening on, please uh, please subscribe. Uh, number one impact wrestling podcast and uh, cover it in a very positive light. And of course, you know, mixed with some honesty, but uh, I think we cover very honestly, very realistically. Whoops, I'm sorry. But I think we cover it very positive, very realistically. And, and like I said, honest. Um, so let's talk impact second quarter. So Adam, um, from going into the first quarter and the second quarter, this is about the time, you know, redemption was happening and everything. This was like a transition period for the company. And uh, it seems like we're always going into transition periods. But uh, basically what I mean with this is that the the first set of tapes and tapings we had after Redemption, which honestly I didn't care for a majority of them. Uh, now, you know, now what they're doing on TV is phenomenal. But uh, there was only a couple episodes in Orlando I really cared for. And maybe it was, maybe it was just the uh, crowd taking me out of it. I don't know. But there were some bad angles. And, and these are angles that right now on, t on TV, we're not seeing anything like this from them. Um, right now, it's a much more mature product, a lot of cursing. Um, I, I would imagine we're going to start seeing some sexuality here. Uh, it's almost like their, their attitude era, era, so to speak. It's like, it seems like where they're going. But we got some bad angles. We got the spirit guide, uh, the fat shaming. Um, I guess that kind of led to what KM and, and Falaba are doing. And... With that being said, grain of salt with the fat shaming thing. That is a social issue. That is something that, you know, um, people can relate to. But uh, it was kind of done done in a, a humorous manner. So, And I guess that led to Tyrus uh, leaving the company. Did that make you sad at all? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I'm st I've still got a teardrop tattoo. I'm not done, you know, when Tyrus left. Uh, I'm not upset about it. No, no, no genuine. I mean, I mean great. He, the fact that they got rid of him, that was, you know, not the best move they could have done, and that's, I don't think they would have got rid of him if they didn't if they didn't want to. You know, he wanted to go, but yeah, no loss at all, absolutely no loss at all. And what it's allowed is most probably the actual storyline to develop, you know, into what the KM Falabar thing is now. Because I don't think we would have got this program at all that these two guys are on, and it's been very entertaining. I think, you know, you know me, I always go on about KM and Falabar being two of my favorite things on the show. So yeah, Tyrus going great you know even most of the guys who left actually around this time i've no issue with them leaving. i think they'd given all they could to to impact so i've no issue at all with with, with tyrus or any of them yeah yeah i kind of wanted laurel van Ness to stick around because she was finally getting to a point where she could wrestle and i know you agree with me like we think she's one of the best mm. uh wrestlers out there but it would be hard if you think of storm ec3 lashley i couldn't see them in today's setting right now i could i it doesn't they don't feel like they would fit with everything you know they're doing absolutely right i mean the only one i i, I it's funny i told all the guys that we think that have left um storm is the longest serving but he was most probably the one who i could see potentially still being there and involved in some storyline because he's so good on the mic you know he, he can work a crowd i mean you look at the eddie edwards storyline with tommy dreamer you could maybe have seen storm in that kind of angle as well of trying to calm down eddie edwards but you know it is what it is oh yeah you know what that that you got a point there he would have he would have fit into that really really well um i i personally think um i think this is going to transition into something with moose next because you know uh eli drake had brought up you know back when they were trying to when uh eli was trying to wrestle moose uh case for case like oh you can win the titles with eddie edwards i feel like that was that dropped the hint of something so if uh, if Moose happens to win the title of Slammiversary, um, and this podcast may come out after Slammiversary, I hope not. But, um, you know, maybe Eddie moves into a title picture, the title picture. But I can see Eddie and Moose doing something here pretty soon. Um, but we're going to talk about Eddie a little bit later. 
and Sammy Callahan, of course. And uh, but you know, like I said, it, things kicked off with some bad angles. Um, I think they were throwing some shit at the wall to see what would stick. Uh, a lot of it wasn't. You know, the Spirit Guide had some potential, and I talked at nauseum about you know the the crowd, the Impact Zone crowd in Orlando didn't understand a storyline because everything happened backstage. So when Josh Matthews came out, like they were, because they were cheering Matt Seidel for several episodes on Impact, even though he was a heel, because <laughs> they had they had no clue what the storylines were. It was all backstage, and that is one area where there's a disconnect where you don't have live programming. So you know from week to week, the crowd isn't uh, doesn't follow, uh, you know, the, the, as far as the live crowd. So that that's one disconnect we have. But um, that was an angle that had some potential and ended up being really bad. And much of the second half of last year was spent trying to get Johnny Impact and El Patron over. You know, they put a lot of effort in Alberto El Patron, gave him a couple chances, uh, bit him in the ass. And, uh, you know, Johnny Impact never really kind of got over, I think, the way they wanted him to. Do you feel like the El Patron being fired and, you know, even even in a smaller scale, Tyrus leaving, do you think that, you know, El Patron being fired and then, on a, on a lower level, Tyrus leaving. Do you think that this kind of uh, change of thinking of of companies' management, how they're handling talent, because uh, this seems like the first set of tapings now where we're not seeing someone no longer with the company anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I think that they are going to start trying to tie people down to contracts as well. And I don't think necessarily exclusive contracts in the same way they might have done with EC3 in the past or Tyrus. You know, you look at someone like, as you say, Johnny Impact or or even, um, I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, Tyre and, and, and a couple others. I, I, Ishimori, you know, those kind of people, I think they're going to bring them in, but also tie them to a storyline, you know, where they say you've got to appear for, for so long with us. So, yeah, I, I think it, it's most probably a good thing that they've changed their mind. And, and and just going back to a couple of things you said there about Alberto's departure and also the the um, uh, what Sadell's spiritual guide. I, I read somewhere earlier this week that apparently it wasn't supposed to be Josh Matthews. I believe it was going to be Jeremy Borash it was going to be the original reveal because he left. Uh, they changed it to Josh Matthews at the last minute. So, so there you go. Uh, there, there's something for our listeners. I think what I remember reading, uh, you know, we're strictly speaking rumors here. I thought the plan always was for Matt, but I mean, Matt, who the hell's Matt? Matt Seidel, right? Um, the plan, the plan was always for Josh, but I think Josh was supposed to transition into his manager because I think Don Callis had said, or maybe I just read it somewhere that the announced team was going to be Jeremy Borash and Don Callis. So I think they were transitioning Josh out of the booth, but when Jeremy Borash left, uh, you know, he came back in. Uh, but last quarter, we, we got a lot of Josh and Sanjay in the booth. Now we're getting Josh and Don Callis in the booth. And even though I don't mind Sanjay, I don't, I don't like their chemistry necessarily, but, but I think Sanjay does a pretty good job. Um, you know, some, sometimes he would kind of crack these little corny laughs and, and I don't know, like they just had a weird dy dynamic between the two of them, um, that I didn't, I didn't care for. And I think a lot of them don't, but Sanjay does, they, he does good. He does a lot of the one night on least twitches, whatever. Um, but what do you got on the, on the commentary this year? So he, my thoughts real quick, um, I think. I like Josh more than the average person does, but uh, I think the only thing that's really missing from what they're doing is I wish Josh was a little more clear cut. Josh is pretty much babyface now. He's not going back and forth like he was when side is doing the mm. thing with Seidel. And then Don Callis is almost back and forth. Like sometimes he's real heelish and sometimes he's kind of, you know, walking the line. But I think uh, they're learning. Uh, I shouldn't say learning a lot from each other. I think Josh is learning a lot from Don, a lot from Don and I think uh, the commentary right now is a lot better. Um, I wouldn't say they need to move on from Josh. A lot of people do. I think some of the additional content, the the pre-shows and the Twitch stuff, and you know, I think they need to do less Josh for all that. I think we need to start needing to start needing to see a new face, uh, you know, um, in instances like that. But what do you got on the commentary right now and how that's going? Okay, well, first of all, to address Josh, I, I think he does get. A bit of a raw deal um not because he, he's not particularly great uh, but just by the fact that he's been saddled with people who aren't very good themselves and when you get color commentators who 
are great. They make the play-by-play guy look even worse. And and I think really that's been one of the problems why Josh is so disliked because let's face it, he's had Pope, he's had Jeremy Borash recently, and he had Sanjay. And Sanjay, as as you said, I, I quite agree with you that Sanjay, you know, he he got better, and there were some bits where I thought he was very good, like the bit where. Josh took off the microphone and went into the ring. I thought that whole segment with Sanjay, where he was commentated by himself, was hilarious. But now that they've got Don Callis in, Don Callis is the best colour commentator I have heard since Bobby the Brain. And I'm not just, you know, trying to, you know, really over-egg it here and talk up impact. I mean, when you think of over the last... Thinking of WWE as well now, when you think of the colour commentator since Bobby the Brain, who have you had? You've had Jerry Lawler. Okay, he was all right. In his prime, he was he was, he was decent. You've had Taz. Taz was awful as a colour commentator. He was funny in spells, but not very good. You've had JBL. Okay, not too bad. Booker T, not too bad. Yeah, um... Cole, Michael Cole sometimes, you know, none of them have been particularly good. Don Callis is just absolutely spot on. And he reminds me of that Jesse Ventura, you know, Bobby the Brain kind of almost smarky, you know, sarcastic commentator. And he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. He makes quips. And because he's so good, Josh has now become a lot better as a play-by-play guy. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's like any good feud, you know, Eli Drake is a brilliant character in the ring, but you put him in a crap feud where Johnny Impact and Alberto were feuding over number one contendership as opposed to actually feuding over the title. And Eli's Drake title run looks rubbish, not because Eli was rubbish, but because he had no foil. And it's the same with the commentary. I, I think Don Callis has made such a difference to the product just from commentary. And I think with the commentary too, like it's sounding passionate again. So I like Josh when he was with the Pope. Um, I, I like Josh like less jokes. I don't mind if he's cutting jokes uh, in between matches, which saying that I just realized they didn't do that uh, green screen stuff this episode. I don't even know if they've done it this whole set of tapings, but it's something I, I don't like. Um, I guess most people probably don't care, but uh they didn't do that this time around. But if they do do that, I'm I'm cool with Josh having a little more of a sense of humor and stuff. Like in the booth, I think that the the play by play should be re- very serious, um, and the color commentary is the one who's supposed to add that something extra. But they both, you know, this includes Josh. They've been much more passionate. And, and you know, if you remember those last, uh, oh my lord, those last few weeks with Josh and Jeremy Borash, like I wanted to light myself on fire and throw myself out the window at times, like. That Jeremy Barris was so bad, and I, all I was thinking was like, dude, this guy's like a career TNA guy. Like, we are stuck with this guy for years in the booth, you know. And, and of all people, he got up and left. Um, they made the change, and uh, and it's been good, you know, because Josh and Jeremy Barris were just they, uh, you know, they did Barbed Wire Massacre three, and there was no passion, and and um, I, now we're hearing a lot more passion between both of them, and I agree, he's made he's made Josh a lot better. And, uh, you know, props to them. Um, but, you know, maybe maybe try a new play-by-play for Twitch and one night only. You know, give Josh a break and then try to groom somebody. But uh, the one night onlys, I'm just going to really briefly get into them. Uh, we've had Cali Combat. I, I still have to watch the last couple matches. That was a pretty good show. Um, Zero Fear, which was excellent. Best one night only in years. And the one night only's these partnerships have been so much better than uh, the the one night only's of past. Twitch we had Lucha versus Underground. I mean, I'm sorry, Lucha Underground versus Impact. I was there, um, and I've said I I won't go back to that again. Uh, it was a good show, but um, you know the the uh, Lucha smarks in the audience. I'm not doing that again. Uh, Penta does Iowa. Tried to watch that one, but the um, the camera work was so bad on it. I I just I couldn't. Um, and Rise of the Knockouts, I was there, and that was good. And uh, I watched that one on Twitch as well, and that w- that came out pretty good. But th- with these Twitch shows, they seem to have streaming issues. Hopefully they uh, work on that soon. And then on Twitch, I haven't seen Joe Hendry's show yet, but they have uh, Behind the Lights with Anthony Corelli and Alicia. It was Anthony Corelli, uh, Anthony Corelli and Iceman. I'm really happy they got Alicia doing it because I think she's amazing. And Iceman for me was like just way too loud and... You know, him and Anthony weren't speaking at the same speaking volume. 
uh, and it annoyed me quite a bit. But that's actually a pretty good little podcast. I don't know if you've seen it or not. It's a, it's a little long. It's two hours, but it, it's really good. It's very interactive, but the problem is nobody watches it. So I, w- I would like to see them get that on the GWN as well and then maybe upload to YouTube a week later or so and uh, hopefully cross-promote cross, cross promote a little bit and um, get a little more eyes on the Twitch stuff because it's a, that podcast is like a lot of effort and uh, little output, a uh, little reward at the end of the day. But have you, have you got a chance to listen to that at all? I, I'll be honest with you, all the Twitch stuff, all, all that kind of stuff, uh, I don't, um, you know, I, I, over in the UK, you know, obviously it's all online, so you can go and watch it. But j- just from a personal life point of view, I, the, the wife rolls her eyes when I say I want to watch Impact for two hours a week and then record a podcast. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately not. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm, my, my valet doesn't let me. Well, <laughs> I can understand that, but but I hope uh, you know some of the listeners who haven't been watching this, you know, uh, so we can keep it on and everything. I hope you guys check it out because they actually do an excellent job. It's just uh, no one's watching it, unfortunately. Uh, we had Redemption, which uh, which kind of kicked everything off, and uh, w- it was a solid pay per view. It was, it was pretty good. It was it was better than uh, Bound for Glory, which was the previous pay per view, which was, in my opinion, the only bad pay per view they've put on in a while. But Redemption was uh, very solid. Uh, I don't want to say they played it safe, but they didn't necessarily um, get over their heads. They said, we're going to put on a good show, and uh, we're, we're not going to try to uh, overbook it. Because that was that was the problem with Bound for Glory. It was uh, highly overbooked. So main event, the only couple things I'm going to talk about real quick. The main event, um, it was supposed to be the big you know, uh, build was Alberto El Patron. And Austin Aries, and uh, you know they did the segments with the steak and all that stuff, and the press conference. I was there for the press conference live, and uh, it's weird because I, I I was there physically and saw Alberto Patron literally exit the door and leave the company <laughs> to never be seen again. So they ended up changing the main event, and it was um, Austin Aries in a three way with Pentagon Junior. and Phoenix Pentagon wins the title, creates buzz online, takes the title into the set of tapings, didn't work, uh, no extra viewers, which was crazy because he's one of the coolest wrestlers out there and, and it wasn't, um, didn't appear to be, now we're not on the inside, but didn't appear to be uh, generating a whole lot of extra interest at first. And it was really weird because he, I mean, uh, granted he speaks no English, but there was no promos. You know, of all the times they give us these video segments of Moose and Madison Rain and all these people, we didn't get a single Pentagon Jr. uh, video package while he was champion. And then he was in a lot of really pointless matches. So the the, uh, era of Pentagon, supposed to be a big deal, wasn't. Um, Now what he's doing with Sammy is miles better. But uh, what do you got on um, Pentagon's title reign? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, just to touch on Alberto, um, obviously quite rightly fired, given to how many chances he's acted unprofessionally. However, his on-screen character throughout his tenure, I thought was excellent. Uh, it was all the off, you know, backstage stuff, which caused his downfall. Um, and it's a real shame because I, I was quite looking forward to seeing the match of Alberto versus Aries. Having said that, uh, the, the era of uh, Pentagon... As he quietly said, I think they just put the title on him to create some buzz to try and get that jump in the needle, which unfortunately didn't work. But one of the few failings, and it's been very, very few failings in the last quarter for Impact, was the build of, of Pentagon. They they put the title on him and they just gave him some matches. That was it. No, you know, you had very few vi- vignettes. I, I remember one that you had with uh, El Chocolata, whatever his name was, uh, Fantasma. Uh, yeah, that was about the only promo I can remember. Um, but once again, that was just one to camera promo. There was no backstory. There was nothing else to explain anything. So it's disappointing. Um, but I think I personally believe they did the right thing in taking uh, correcting that mistake uh, as quickly as they made it. Totally agreed. Uh, the other big talking point from Redemption was Tessa Blanchard. Uh, this is someone I'm, I'm just I've been a major fan of for a long time. Uh, and we talk about all the time, obviously separately because we never podcast together, but she's, she's uh, an absolute star in the making. She does everything right. Um, there's, there's no weakness to her game. 
uh, she shows up and, you know, they, they had booked Taya versus Kiero, very random match for the pay-per-view, uh, was obviously booked to get Tessa on the show without taking away from the knockouts title match. So, uh, very smart the way they did that. And she's, uh, recently signed a deal. They said it's long-term two years. She's had, uh, I want to say she's wrestled four times. Uh, she's two and zero against Kiara Hogan and she's oh and two against Madison rain. And, uh, she's again, ready to face Ali at the pay-per-view here shortly. What do you got on uh, Tessa Blanchard so far? Absolute megastar in the making. And when I say in the making, she, she's pretty much there. She, she, she's such a well-rounded developed character already in ring. And also she understands her character. She knows where to look on camera. She knows how to interact, you know, how to cut a promo. Absolutely fantastic. Honestly, they couldn't have signed a better knockout. The only thing that's been disappointing, and it's not Tessa's fault, is that obviously they've had Madison Rain go over her twice. And although she, you know, they've been seen a bit as fluky wins, I still think it's done a little bit of damage, especially the second time. So, but there you go. You know, it is what it is. But Tessa herself, amazing signing and they've tied her down to a long-term contract uh brilliant you know she is going to be you know when her contract comes up next year or two years whatever it is everyone's going to be clambering for her it's going to be tough to keep her in a couple of years that's for sure mm. um you know they she would have to flat out be the face of this division um you know she would probably be a baby face by this point uh, most stars with star written all over them can only be a, a, bit, a heel for so long. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Eli Drake in that, um, in that same breath, but she's, she's been amazing. I just feel that, you know, maybe if I had to speculate with her, you know, not being on a long-term contract at the moment, they weren't going to put her over a whole lot, uh, which we're seeing that with Rich Swan right now too. You know, they haven't, uh, put ink to paper yet. So, you know, we've seen them get, pinned twice in two and three matches so far um but she, she can bounce back from it I, I fully expected her to beat madison rain at under pressure i actually thought you know this is fantasy booking in my head but i thought they were gonna go like a a legend killer gimmick with her that's that's why i thought they brought madison back i was like okay she's gonna run through madison um and they're gonna try to bring back you know a couple you know angelina for a one-off velvet for a one-off you know maybe i'm totally fantasy booking here but that was in my head what I th where I thought they were going with it. Uh, she was going to, you know, it, it had to do with her promos too. Like I thought she was just going to knock out the knockouts of the old. And uh, obviously that's not what they're doing, but we'll see what happens with slam reversary and what, what, what happens with her going forward. Um, but, but rich Swan again, I think he's still in that ballpark. You know, if they, if they um, sign him to something, then uh, we'll probably see a little more success, but the big signings of the, of the quarter, with the exception of those two were, La uh, I'm sorry, Lashley, uh, Brian Cage and Sue Young. And Brian Cage, if this were two years ago, he'd be champion already. He would have won <laughs> champion in the first set of tapings that he showed up. And I think they've handled him perfectly. He got two wins. People were saying, oh, he hasn't had a competition. He beat Bobby Lashley twice. So he hasn't talked. Both, neither of these two have talked. And I heard you on the Impact Review saying, you know, wonder how she is on the mic. I hope neither of these two talk. I think, uh, La you know, I keep saying Lashley because I'm staring that on my notes here. Cage, I could see him cutting a promo here and there, but remember at first he was very silent, wouldn't speak. And I've talked about this ad nauseum as well, is, is oftentimes when you put the microphone in someone's hand, they lose all momentum. They lose everything that makes them mysterious. You know, um, once they started putting Broken Matt Hardy out there with a microphone, you know, his character was getting ruined week by week. Uh, even, even Rosemary sometimes cutting promos in the ring. And I've always used the shield as an example. You know, they used to do the promos very similar to what Sammy and OBE do. Um, they, and then they start showing up in the ring with a microphone. And now these guys aren't as mysterious anymore. And we don't see OBE and Sammy in the ring with a microphone. They, they've been very calculated on who's going to have mic time and how are these people going to speak? And, um, I hope we keep them mysterious, but these are the two big signings. I think they've handled cage perfect sue young got a quick loss you know quick title shot quick loss <laughs> and now she's the champion so with her they kind of went that route they put the title on the shiny new toy but um i love her i love what she's doing 
Uh, what do you got on? Uh, we'll start with uh, Brian Cage. Thoughts of uh, how they've done with him so far? Um, fantastically well. And the reason being is that they could have booked him like Goldberg, where he just ran through squashing people. But what they did in his world tour was they put him in ring with people we hadn't seen uh, elsewhere in other promotions. But he looked vulnerable, uh, and that's what's great about it. That that you know he's obviously a huge guy, can fly around, absolutely incredible athlete. And, you know, it, you always want to see his matches because you just don't know what's going to happen. But the good thing is, is that whoever he's fought, he's always let them get offense in. With the exception of KM, I think, everyone has got a bit of offense in. And especially on, as I said, on his world tour, there were some times we actually thought, my God, he's going to lose. Yeah, which uh, is very good booking. So I think they've done really well with him. Um I, the Congo Kong match of a week was excellent, by the way, as well. That was really, really good stuff. Uh, I think yeah, you oh, yeah. reviewed that match. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know where they're going to go with him. I mean, Ro and I have talked about it quite a lot. Are they going to put the X Division belt on him? I don't know. I mean, he is screaming out for a mid-card belt to hold on to for six months so they keep him out of the main event scene but give him something to defend on telly each week. Um, you know, uh, something like a TV title or even the grand championship, if they'd have still had it, that would have been ideal for him. So I, I think they've done fantastically well with him. I think uh, Matt Seidel has been a really, really good X division champion and he's held the title for a long time, which is going to make, if Brian Cage wins, it's going to make it a special win and not a, you know, Cage is already 0 for 1. He lost by count out. So, mm. you know, they're not just throwing him to the forefront. And if he does win, it's going to mean something because Seidel has been a really good champion. Uh, what have you thought about Sue Young so far? I'm a bit mixed on this one because she came out to crickets, you know, in the impact zone. And it was a bit of a shame because she deserved better. And she's once again a fully developed character. But I don't think impact have done her a great justice because they haven't really told her story of why she's the undead bride. Um and I, I don't mind the hokey stuff that they do, you know, with like this week, Madison Rain getting, you know, transported to a forest kind of thing. I quite like all that spooky, creepy stuff. But I don't know. I feel like they're not really defining who Sue Young is as opposed to just I, I know you've got to have some mystery. But at the same time, you know, if I just turned up in, in a top hat and I was the ringmaster, you, you would wonder why I'm walking around in a top hat and red tail and goats. You wouldn't just think, oh, there's a loony there who's dressed up as a ringmaster. You'd want to know a bit of backstory. And they did that with Rosemary, didn't they, with the Bram storyline. You know, they tried to explain it a little bit, although that kind of disappeared again. But, you know, I, I think they need to do something like that with Sue Young. And I think it's been, you know, if she loses the title, it's not going to be a huge upset because you don't see her that often uh, other than in backstage stuff. Right, right. You know, and this is, this is a, um, you know, mistake that, WWE has made for years where they just they try to get everybody on every show and everyone gets overexposed and we're getting everyone and you know she's the knockouts champion it's not like when Jade was knockouts champion and we didn't see her on TV for a month you know Sue Young might not be wrestling necessarily but she, but she's doing you know they, they, they've got her with the uh doing promos or not promos but you know they're doing uh backstage work with her so she still remains relevant but Sue Young uh, I could see her with a long title reign. I really do until until um, Rosemary comes back. With that being said, they're going to have to keep Tessa Blanchard gainfully em employed as far as we know what kind of feuds they're going to give her. Um, but Sue Young, once she loses the title, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting to see how they move forward with her. But uh, I, I think they're... Uh, uh -huh. I, I was just going to interrupt on that one there because you're quite right. When she loses the title, it'll be a problem for her and i was going to compare her to sienna and also rosemary who both have gone through that rosemary not so much as a problem but initially when she lost the title to sienna rosemary kind of really fell away from the knockout scene and i think that could happen to Sue young but where rosemary and to some extent sienna was different and even ali and laurel van ness is that sue young hasn't had a good match yet and I think that's been the problem. It's okay keeping her off telly if that, when she finally wrestles, you see her in a match and you think, this is fantastic. I mean, Sienna and Rosemary had a great feud over the title, but Sue Young's matches have been quite poor from what, from what I remember. Because uh, I, I can't really remember many of her matches. I remember the one with uh, she put uh, Ali in the coffin. But, but other than that, they've been quite see, short. I, I like that one. But yeah, they have been short. Um, they, they, they definitely have been. And it just, the company just has to find a way to progress character 
with new feuds because sometimes if you, you know, um, if Sue Young loses and then she goes into her next feud as the exact same person, you know, obviously you can't mess with her too much, but you just got to find that way. What little tweaks can you make um, to keep that person interesting? Sometimes we get so caught up in two wrestlers feuding with each other that when they split off, uh, they both lose all momentum. And um, that's going to lead me into Eddie Edwards and Sammy Callahan here. Uh, I, I was going to kind of, you, you know what? Let, let me get back to that in a second. Cause I, I do want to, uh, on the Sue Young topic, she did bury Rosemary was done very well. Rosemary was hurt. She had the, the um, match with Taya, which uh, Taya has about th three losses in a row after being um, undefeated for a long time. Forgot what the match was called. I actually wrote it down here, but I can't find it. But, um, Oh, the demon dance. So we never got the red wedding. Unfortunately, uh, we got the demon dance, which was a really good match, but that's the last time we've seen Rosemary wrestle. She was buried. Uh, when she comes back, I think it's going to be really important to, to tweak Rosemary a little bit because she started off as a dark character and then started getting a little cartoony. Um, let's, you know, we'll see what they do with her. And then, um, Sue Young is also, you know, helped progress Allie. Allie is finally that more uh, serious character people have been looking for. So, so Sue Young's work has, uh, has actually helped. So now we'll, we'll take it into Eddie and Sammy. Um, cause I think that's a good transition and it exactly makes my point. Uh, you know, people have said, well, is that feud over? I don't think it's over. I think they're taking a break because, you know, there's only so far those two, those two can go, you know, you, you can't, beat the beat it down people's throats do you remember how um you know we're, we're not experts on this company by any means but you remember like mania time you know they made this big aj versus nakamura thing oh my gosh you know this is a, a dream match on this stage and three months later nobody wants to see that again i mean i see people like oh my god they're wrestling again this please please stop you know there's only so much it don't matter what the matchup is that you can put two guys against each other and uh they have split these guys off, but the best part is that Sammy has continued the heel growth. And I used uh, this, uh, what the hell, hell's the name? Tommaso Ciampa. <laughs> yeah, Ciampa. <laughs> yeah, I used him as an example. And now I'm again not an expert on what he's doing, but I follow enough Twitter and all that stuff to kind of have an, an idea. But people, you know, say, "Oh, this guy's such an amazing heel." I said, yeah, but show me him being a heel against more than one person, more than his ex tag team partner. Show, you know, have him move on to someone else and, and carry that same momentum, you know? And Sammy has, is almost getting better as a heel, uh, with what he's doing with, with Pentagon. And then Eddie Edwards, uh, I think they backed off him a little bit the last couple of tapings. Cause I think it was getting a little excessive. Uh, they, they pulled back on it a little bit, but he's continued to grow, which is insane. Like we, we never thought the character of Eddie Edwards was going to have like character development and growth. I mean, um, he was a white me baby face and their impacts getting away from that. Now we're seeing the cursing on TV. They're speaking like we really speak in real life. And they started with Eddie doing that of all people. I think they wanted to make a statement and he was the perfect guy to, to, to do it with. So general thoughts on eddie edwards sammy callahan you know anything you want to say about that feud or just uh them individually with what they're doing yeah just just to pick up what you said about sammy going from one heelish feud to the next and wondering how he can outdo himself i mean when you we, we just thinking about eddie and pentagon here but don't forget he was also in that lax feud which when it was happening we like saying this is one of the best feuds in years and yet that has now been forgotten because it's been surpassed by what he's done with Eddie. So you're absolutely right. He's, he's, he's the most defined. I talked about Tessa being the most, you know, complete female wrestler. Sammy is the most defined heel and complete heel in the business today. And, you know, that's not once again, talking about impact because he's, I, mean, I don't watch Lucha, but you know, from what I understand, he's just as good in Lucha underground as well. And, and on, um, is it, What's MLW? Is it? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Or whatever. The the other one as well. He does the same on there. So he's just such a great defined character, and he knows the business. He knows how to get people talking, how to get people hating him. Um, so yeah, really, really good stuff. Eddie, you know, I've talked about this on the Impact Review lots of times. You know, he, as you say, he's just white bread, wasn't he? <laughs> you know, just no character at all. Even in his feud with uh, Davy Richards. There was no real character there. He was playing the straight baby face. And now suddenly he's interesting. He's really interesting. And his work has been really, really good with 
Tommy Dreamer. Who would have thought in 2018 I would be excited to see a Tommy Dreamer match or a Tommy Dreamer promo? I, I mean, you could have given me all the money in the world. I wouldn't have guessed that that would be the person who I am actually really looking forward to seeing cut a promo and uh, have a match. But there you go. That, that's how good these this feud has been, is that even though it's gone off in two different directions, you don't care because both of the protagonists have just been fantastic and killed it. I think it's genius, them going in two different directions, and they can always come right back to them. Uh, I, I think it's it's genius. Like I said, I'm, you know, I'm putting it against AJ Nakamura, which on paper should be the biggest possible match you can put together, and nobody wants to see it right now. Um, Eli Drake was in flux for a little while. And he signed a new deal. It was, you know, two or three years. I think most people thought he was gone. I thought he was gone. Um, he's always been a very loyal guy. Decided he wanted to stay. And, you know, he said in interviews, he'd said, he has said so much. So, you know, I, I can, um, I know who I am here. I can go there and get lost in the sauce. You know, Abyss said something very similar when he was going to go there and said, you know what, I, I know what I am here. How do you think they're going to incorporate Eli Drake back in? Obviously, we saw him with we'll do a little something with Joe Hendry, but it seems like the con- the, the uh, content on the show is just getting a little more serious. And uh, Eli Drake walks the line with comedy, even though it's not he's not a comedy character. He's just genuinely funny. Um, do you think that they? I, I said earlier I couldn't see EC3 or Lashley in today's current impact product i think they would stick out like a green hat with an orange bill do you think uh i i I could see that happen with eli drake a little bit too do you think they need to make some changes to to what he does well i think the main event scene well just not the whole car the whole car from top to bottom is crying out for a baby face do we want to see eli as a baby face most probably not but there aren't many other people who could do that and i think he could be that Austin type baby face, you know, he's, he's got the chops for it. He's got a good look, you know, he could be the top baby face. So, you know, it really depends what happens in this main event at Slammiversary, who walks out with the title. If it's not Moose, if it's Aries, then I could see Eli going back in for it. If it is Moose, there's still a ready made storyline there. But as you say, I think, you know, uh, Eddie Edwards might come into the story there with Moose. If it's a, if it's a Moose title win. So yeah, it's a strange one because you don't really know where Eli fits in. We've They've got to start a new program for him. Let's face it, you know, uh, there's nothing on the cards at the moment where he fits in. And it could be that he just has to bide his time to get that second shot. And, you know, now that he's signed a contract, he has got that time because if they keep him, you know, away from the main ascent for another three months and he's got a 12-month contract, you know, that gives him nine months to, to go at the title then. He had the uh, match. Yeah, he had the title match with uh, Pentagon. Um, we're t- and this kind of goes back to the era of Pentagon. Uh, I think the match was eight minutes long for a world title match. Um, was pointless. You know, uh, it was like, let's just get this guy his his cash in. But he, he just always seems to come up short, which is really weird for a, a heel character like that uh, to play from behind. But, you know, now he's in a program, it looks like to see with Joe Hendry and Grado. Um, that's definitely not the main event picture. So uh, they've they've got to find a way to get him back in there. But I totally agree with you. It wasn't his his title reign was really underwhelming, but it wasn't his fault. They just didn't have uh, someone that could go toe to toe with him, you know. But I think they'll do it better this time because look at Aries versus Moose on paper. Like no one wanted to see that. And um, the last several episodes of Impact, they have not even they haven't touched. They haven't been in the ring together. To, you know, like they they've done the build so differently. Um, to where I had just said this last month, they needed to find a way to create a big fight feel. And I think they're doing it this time around with, mm-hmm. with uh, just, just keeping them off TV. Cause if this was another company, they would have wrestled 10 times already before the pay-per-view had mixed tag, not mixed tags, but tag team matches with partners done pick your poison matches, uh, cut 20 minute promos to kick off the show. So they're doing a really good job with that. Um, but how do we uh, reintegrate Eli Drake into that? remains a scene be seen but the thing is like you said he does have a ready-made storyline to an extent with moose uh if they have to do something with aries pentagon you know they can do it eddie edwards you know they can they can make it work yeah and yeah you, you could pretty much because he is that likable he, he could introduce himself into any of the any of the storylines anything at all even sammy callahan you know he could suddenly turn around and saying you know uh, i i don't like the way you're, you you you've tackled 
uh, Pentagon, you know, I'm sticking up for him and then instantly turn face, you know, and get into a program that's not for the title. So, you know, Eli Drake really has got the world in his hands, isn't he? You can go and do whatever he wants with an impact, you know, given the right storyline. I just think that they will make an effort to give him a good story because he's treading water at the moment, let's face it. And he's doing stuff with Joe Hendry and Grado. But once again, that's most probably because it's going to go a Grado Joe Hendry storyline as opposed to something with Eli Drake. And, you know, that seems to be the, the, the direction they're heading there. So Eli's going to be free to do something. I think they made a mistake in, in, spitting up the Steiner Drake tag team, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I think that had a lot more legs, you know, to go. I think it did too. Uh, really, really bad title reign. I mean, dropped it. The, the, the tag team titles played hot potato uh, for a whole set of tapings, but this did start the LAX storyline and, and we got Kingston back, which was awesome. And, you know, I, I've been staying off social media for the tapings. Uh, I still managed to get King spoiled for me and the uh, return of the ogs which i for both of those i would have loved to just been sitting there watching my television and see them pop on um impact does a good job with creating uh you know television that's not um they're actually surprising us you know like the, like it's not um predictable it's just that the spoilers get out there so much we can't enjoy them like that but this has been excellent uh as good as sammy and eddie was and what they're doing with sammy and pentagon like this is what I'm. I cannot wait to see. Um, hopefully, it's not a one and one off at the pay per view. I actually think the OGs are going to win. Uh, you know, you, you talked about this not being a title shot. I actually think they're going to win um, as as a way to extend this. But um, this is this has been excellent uh, thoughts on the LAX storyline. You know, Roe Ro often points out anytime LAX gets the titles, they start getting a little stale, and uh, this is this is some interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean, once again, the, the storyline, the redemption of LAX has been great. It's been really, really good. And I, I, anyone who listens to me doing the reviews of, of Impact know that I'm a huge um, Santana fan. Uh, I, I think he is, you know, a ready-made star in the future. He's going to be a world champion, you know, when they eventually split. Uh, I think Ortiz has got better as well. But um, I, I think that the new LAX, the current LAX, are the best version that there's ever been. And I know that's quite controversial, but I'm talking about in-ring ability. I think that they're, they're incredible. And, and it, I think it's a brilliant storyline and it's great to see Hernandez back. I know Ro was, was quite down on Hernandez, said he looked a bit out of shape and those kind of things. Well, compared to me, he's, he's ripped. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's a great storyline. And once again, this didn't really need the tag titles. That, that, that was the only thing that was a bit disappointing about it. And I mentioned this last week, um, that if... Eddie would have come back and just got them on a winning streak without winning the titles off Z and E, then it would have had the same impact, the storyline. You don't need the titles, especially as they're not actually being challenged for at the pay-per-view. You know, there's another match you could have added, Z and E versus Falabar and KM or, or whoever, or even OVE or, you know, whoever, Cult of Lee. So they didn't need to put the titles back on at LAX at this point. They didn't. They absolutely didn't. Um, I guess it kind of made sense for the, you know, the... the king was wanted to get him back but um this this is a tag team storyline that they did not need the titles and i think that's why they're not on the line because ogs are going to win because you can't you you can't have the titles change this month i mean they changed at the last this much i mean they changed last month at the pay-per-view not last month but a couple months ago and then uh they drop them to z and e who seem like they're going to be the next hot thing and they ended up being the next afterthought um you know, they had a match against uh, Desi Hit Squad after that and lost, and we haven't seen anything from them, heard anything from them since then. I think they actually probably could have got away with the Z and E versus Desi Hit Squad uh, match of the pay per view um, if, if some things were done differently. But the Slamverse rebuild, for the most part, I just think it's been excellent. It started off with that awful number one contenders match, and I don't mean the match was awful, it was the presentation of. You know, this is going to be a number one contenders match. We get it at a House of Hardcore. I think it was House of Hardcore, but um, you know, not not highly attended show. And um, you know, the match didn't have any kind of sense of purpose. And uh, Moose got his number one contendership that way. And uh, you know, there was the case versus case angle and everything that was actually probably a better angle than this. But it started off with a really bad number one contenders 
the whole situation. But it ended up being, I'm actually looking forward to the match now. Uh, whatever they tried to do uh, worked for me, and, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, but real quick, uh, thoughts of the uh, Slam Reversary build in general? Yeah, it's, it's been excellent, you know, and as you quite rightly said, you know, when you think of the storylines that are there, just even two, three weeks ago, you most probably couldn't have guessed the the way that the card has formed, you know, and you think about the main event, you couldn't have seen D'Angelo being involved. Uh, you think of Sammy and Eddie, you, you'd have had that nailed down a month and a half ago as being a, a pay-per-view match, a slammiversary, and yet they've got their own two little feuds going off on the side of it. LAX, you didn't see that coming. So, yeah, the feud is, is, is sorry, the, the build, the storylines have been excellent. There's a few more things that they can fit in. I didn't like the Madison Rain, although the build's been good. I didn't like the way that they've pushed Tessa to the side, but all in all, um, compared to the more recent pay-per-views, this, this has been stellar. You know, the crazy thing with the Madison Rain thing, and this is the knockouts in general. It's like they keep adding knockouts and we keep, oh man, this division is, is uh, you know, growing. It's amazing. It's back to where it was. But then if you look at it on paper, so you get on the website, I just did this yesterday. You look at the knockouts division. You've got Alicia who's not wrestling. Um, she's great for using her in storylines, but they haven't found a way to get her in the ring yet. Um, maybe, maybe she plays a role at the pay-per-view, um, turns on Eddie, who knows? Um, so this should be interesting because we don't know if Eddie's a heel or baby face or what the hell they're doing with him. So, uh, you know, then you got Rosemary injured. You got Sienna injured. And I, I know that Sienna is not on the, um, the roster page. I've chatted her with her one-on-one -on -one about this. She definitely is not letting the cat out the bag either way. But if, if I had to read between the lines, I think, she, um, I think she's just because she's injured. She's not, a uh, you know, the contract ran out and they're not going to negotiate with her. She's not cleared to wrestle. So I, I really think that's, uh, that what, that's what happened, but you know, she's, uh, she's unable to compete. Um, thank God they brought, just brought Allie back. I mean, I, I guess, cause I thought she was going to be out of commission for a while storyline wise, but if you really look at what they have, um, rebels, not on the website, but you know, she's traveling with them. She did the photo shoot with them. That's usually a pretty good sign, but she, they, you can't really put her in a title match. Um, so it's hard, you know, if you really look at the roster and, you know, Ty was gone for a little bit getting married. Um, <laughs> like they only have a handful of knockouts to use. And Kiara is the other one, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Kiara. Yeah. Well, she, yeah, she's good to go. Um, Shotzi Blackheart got hurt. Um, so, and, and I would imagine they're going to add her to the roster. I wouldn't see why they wouldn't. Oh, she's broken her ankle though. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. But I'm just saying like, obviously, uh, that's going to take some time, but. And the undead bridesmaid as well. Yeah. <laughs> just just <laughs> freaking sign Casey Spinelli. Like, what's going on here? Um, uh, can I just ask, how do you send her her performance check? You know, how do you, do you make it out to Mrs. You bridesmaid? I, I would think so. I would think so, yeah. Has she got union representation? I don't know. You know, I just I want to know all these questions. I, I thought she did a good job with that. I, I really She did. was very good. Um, you know, it was obviously her, but she did, she found a way to not wrestle like herself for the most part. So I, I think she did good, but you know, if, if you look at it, there's not a lot of knockouts to work with. So it's almost like you can see, okay, this is why they had to use Madison. Um, and she's a knockout on the roster on the page. So, you know, we'll see, but um, we're not going to get into this whole Madison rain thing a little bit, but uh, you know, we got the mystery knockout coming. Most likely is going to be a heel. So they still do need to add some knockouts. Uh <laughs> It just got too many out of commission or, or involved in storylines. You know, th this was, this happened years ago when they had Raquel who didn't really wrestle Maria, who didn't really wrestle Ali, who didn't wrestle. They had this whole knockout roster of, of, of girls who didn't get in the ring. Rosemary wasn't wrestling at the time. So, uh, they're kind of even that, um, situation again, but all right. So last two topics I want to go over, uh, first, first one, you guys talk about this on a review a little bit, but the mystery attacker segment with killer cross. Now this was something that the um, spoiler never got out there because there wasn't a spoiler. It was all backstage segments. So obviously the company is saying, okay, we, sometimes we come up with these really good angles. You know, DCC was one. We all knew who they were weeks in advance. Um, it would have been really cool to find out as they were revealed. And uh, with this one, we all found out together for the most part. If you're, uh, unless you um, 
you know, I know you watch the show a little bit past us in the U S so maybe you, you know, you knew ahead of time or, or whatever, but for the most part, this was a surprise everyone. So, uh, what, what do you got on that whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, it was a surprise to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes do peek at spoilers, but yeah, this one, no one knew, did they? Cause I think it aired two weeks before the new tapings, I think, or the last week before the tapings. So it was a complete surprise. A uh, fantastic, I mean, really well done. Um, I'm intrigued to see where they go with him. And it's it's been a while since we've had a heel who doesn't seem phased by people punching him, you know, or hitting him with chairs and those kind of things. That psycho heel. So, yeah, great stuff. Really well presented. I, I love his, you know, his catchphrase of, was it everyone pays the toll or something like that? And, uh, yeah, he's just a, a really intense guy. He can cut a great promo. I believe he, he, he was making his own promos, wasn't he, in a similar vein? So... It's just another example of what I've been saying about Tessa, about Sammy. He's someone who just gets his character and plays it perfectly. Yeah, and uh, they fooled me when they started putting uh, throwing Sanjay and Petey in there. I thought it was, I thought it had something to do with them. Um, so the crazy thing is, though, even though Petey's going to get his match uh, Thursday, and this will probably come out after Thursday, you know, uh, Sanjay's involvement in this kind of disappeared because he he was the one that accused, P, accused PD so maybe we'll see something on TV but uh I just thought it was really well done I, I saw some people disappointed with you know the reveal I'm like dude that was that was amazing the way he was dressed up like a security guard and all that so I'm not being funny but what what were these people expecting I mean did they think suddenly it was going to be Hulk Hogan or you know someone bigger you know it's a guy I've never heard of but I'm instantly interested because he's fantastic on screen. You know, he's really good. So uh, I, I don't know what these, these people, th there's some people out there in the internet wrestling community online who just want to moan about anything. Yeah. Part of the problem with wrestling today is that people fantasy book things in their head um, to the point that it's just unrealistic. And they, um, you know, instead of just waiting to see what happens, they want to take guesses. They want to do this and this, and they build it up in their head that it's going to be all the way up to damn AJ Styles. You know, and then uh, <laughs> that's not who it is when they get disappointed. So, um, yeah, I feel you on that. Last thing I want to ask you, um, Austin Aries is the current champion. Uh, his, it's his second reign. Would you say he's the best champion since, I don't know, EC3? You know, you, you could say maybe Lashley. Lashley was a good champion, a good dominant heel. But, I mean, I think what he's doing for the title has is, is been amazing. You know, Drew Galloway was a boring champion. Eddie was not the best champion. Um, we've talked in at length about Eli Drake as a champion. And again, this is not necessarily based on the, the wrestlers. You know, sometimes it's the stories around him, the moving pieces around him. Um, but what do you got on his reign, though? Uh, just really compared to everything else we've had in the past. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's, it's only when you said the EC3 then I was thinking, actually, wait there. Let me go back and think there must be another champion somewhere who's been good. But you, you're absolutely right, you know. Don't get me wrong, Eli Drake, we've talked about it already on the show. You know, I think he's fantastic, but he wasn't a great champ, not, not through his own fault. Uh, Austin Aries, he, he's been great. And I, I, we haven't actually talked about this, but but uh, tonight, earlier on, before we did this show, I did the Austin Aries uh, teleconference this week. And uh, he was completely different to how he has been when I've interviewed him in the past. I mean, I thought he was an awful person, horrible person when I interviewed him last time, you know, really full of himself. And although he's got that confidence still, he came over as someone who actually really, really liked Impact in its current format. And on these teleconference calls, I have never heard anyone say, uh, basically to paraphrase him, he said, guys, listeners, if you haven't watched Impact in a long time, check it out. He said, the management here, creative here, they're doing fantastic work and it's a completely different vibe than, than what you used to get. And he even commented on things like, you know, you see these comments online, you know, lol TNA. Um, but he said, it's different now. He said, if you haven't watched it in a while, check it out. You're going you're gonna to love it. And I've never heard a rest on the telecom say that. And I've certainly never heard Austin Aries, who, let's face it, he's very much into the pro Austin Aries business in promoting himself and not the companies he works for, especially with the belts. He was com the complete company man. And, and fair play to him. He's been a great champ. He carries himself like a champ, which some of the other ones haven't. 
uh, he really carries himself like a champ and he's done some great work for the company out with just the TV product. So I think he's, he's been excellent and uh, I've always liked him. Um, but since he's turned heel, he's been great. Yeah, I totally agreed. Um, as a you know, it's it's really difficult to book a babyface champion, but now in the new, new um, format of, of Impact, where they're willing to walk that line a little bit uh, with language and everything, I'm curious to see what happens the next time a babyface is the champion. Um, you know, they're going to be more edgier than what we've seen in the past, so that'll be pretty interesting. But all in all. I, everything they're doing right now is really good. Uh, not everything, but most. They're firing on all cylinders for the most part. Um, the Orlando tapings, again, uh, when, I, when, when I was getting ready to do this podcast, I was looking at the results of the matches, you know, just kind of going over all the uh, all the uh, episodes of Impact over the three months. Man, we got some trash matches uh, <laughs> compared to what they're doing this set of tapings. I mean, I look back at it and I would look at the entire card of the four matches. I'm like, there's nothing on here that people want to tune into. And it wasn't against the talent. It was just the storylines going on and some of the matchups they, they were putting against each other. Um, you know, you know kind of like the R Richard justice with Tyrus and uh, whoever they teamed up with, um, you know, against uh, Othalaba against KM and whoever the, I, I don't even remember, you know what I'm saying? But, some yeah, of those, yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. Some of those matches, my like, dude, was I really getting excited for this stuff? You know, a few months ago. And it's funny, you know, one one of the things we haven't talked about uh, on, on tonight's show was we haven't even mentioned the Cult of Lee, who've been also very, very entertaining during this whole piece. You know, and we, we forget that you know, last the first quarter of the year, there, as you say, there was some trash in there, uh, and now you're forgetting about good segments because there's so much better stuff than that so i i think they, they've had an excellent second quarter and um it really seems that they've they've got the concept of what they want the show to be now and that if you go back to the first block of tapings i think it was the uh ontario tapings which are the first ones with um damore and don Callis. those tapings they didn't really have like a feel to them. It was just, there's some matches. We've got an idea where we want the storylines to go, but one show from week to week felt different. Whereas now they all, they don't feel the same. Well, they feel the same, but they, they don't look the same. You know, the storylines do progress. You know, you have some stuff like the Sue Young, you have stuff like the, the Sammy Callan, Eddie Edwards stuff, but th there's, there's a, there's a feel like it is a continuous series that you're watching as opposed to just a makeshift thing that's been put together to highlight shows. And, and that's where the, the real success has come for this. They, they've got, a vision and, and they're sticking to it yeah absolutely um good thing so can't wait to see what happens uh with the toronto tapings that could be an even better crowd slammiversary apparently is sold out and uh someone sent me a screenshot of their ticket for the tapings and um he was ticket like 900 something so looks like the uh television tapings should have a really nice audience as well i don't know what they were for this current one in windsor um if you if you think the impact zone in orlando is usually 300 people I mean, it's at least at least double that. Yeah, and it, it was it was something that was quite interesting that that once again, um, Austin Aries brought up on the teleconference tonight. He said that you don't need a big room, a stadium, to make a good audience. It's about picking the right venues and filling it up and and having that that great crowd. Because he was asked a question directly about the Orlando crowd, and it, he said, you know, it's like going to watch your favorite rock band at the same venue every week. He said you would get fed up with it. You wouldn't go, you know. And he said that's what it's like for some of these fans in Orlando. And he said it is important to to move around. And and you know, I think he brought up the Windsor taping, saying you know there's about a thousand people there at most. But he said that the difference in atmosphere is fantastic. And going out to an electric crowd like that is just incredible. Hell yeah! I was gonna say yeah. Um, I was saying at least six hundred, but I think that's what the six hundred was about. What I think the um the crowds were last time they were in Canada when they were um wherever they had bound for glory at. So yeah, it looks like thousand ballpark to me. So should be the same and awesome stuff. So hope you guys uh, dug this second quarter review. Uh, I'll be back in a few months to revort review the third quarter, which will include um, slam anniversary and the build up to bound for glory. And hopefully uh, the fourth quarter will be different. Usually that's where they kind of check out for a, <laughs> a couple months, but uh, we'll see what happens with this new regime. So for Adam, this is BQ. Good talking to you. Talk to you soon. Peace.